Well, welcome back to another episode of the Addy Hour. It's my privilege, of course, to be able to continue hosting these conversations. And today I'm absolutely honored to be able to host former Congressman Patrick J. Kennedy for a conversation about mental health, about politics, and about advocacy. So obviously this is a name that I'm sure is familiar to all of you as listeners, but I want to give due due diligence and do a little bit of introduction uh, for Congressman Kennedy as well. So during his time in Congress, Patrick J. Kennedy was the lead author of the landmark Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, also known as the Federal Parity Law, which requires insurers to cover treatment for mental health and substance use disorders with no more restrictively than they would for treatment for illnesses of the body. As founder of the Kennedy Forum, he now unites advocates, policymakers, and business leaders to advance evidence-based practices and policies in mental health and addiction. In 2017, he was appointed to the President's Commission on Combating Drug Addiction and the Opioid Crisis. He currently serves as co-chair of the National Action Alliance, specifically for the Suicide Prevention's Mental Health and Suicide Prevention National Response to COVID-19 and he serves as co-chair of the Bipartisan Policy Center's Behavioral Health Integration Task Force. So someone who has been about this work for a very long time, I did mention to the congressman before we got on the air that I had the privilege of actually hearing him speak at an event back in 2014 here in New Haven, a global health and the arts event, and I was struck by just his candor and sharing his story and really trying to move things forward. Um, I will also say that on a personal note, it's been just... Um, a joy and an honor for me to see the ways that he's continued to be about this work on so many different levels, really addressing things like stigma, of course, thinking about policy, also thinking about access to care, insurance, but then also tying in and making sure that we have an understanding of what happens in mental illness and understanding the brain and really having research to move that forward. So I'm absolutely honored again to be able to welcome former Congressman Patrick J. Kennedy to the Addy Hour. Thank you, Dr. Addy. It's a pleasure to be with you. And I just want to thank you on behalf of all my fellows who've benefited from professions of psychiatry and psychology for all you've done to uh, try to face the challenge that we're facing as a nation by dedicating your careers and your you know, mission to, to really helping people, not only on a medical level, but just really help them, uh, you know, build back some agency and reclaim their lives and no longer kind of be marginalized because society would do that to them ordinarily. Mm -hmm. And so thank you so much. You do have a spiritual dimension to your job, which is underappreciated because Mm -hmm. When you're restored to physical uh, well-being, you know, the transformations to your family and community are so enormous, but that's not often appreciated in the, in the work that you do. So thank you for that. Oh, of course. And thank you. Thank you for those kind words. Um, and, and in a lot of ways, this podcast, in addition to you know what I do on a professional level, has been um, a joy to be able to pull so many different people together, as you've alluded to as well, um, even as you talked about the spiritual component, and just to be able to have different people come together in this podcast forum, but just in, even in the event that you did back in 2014 to see researchers and clinicians um, and actors and, and public advocates all in the same space trying to move these things forward. Um, so I know we're complimenting each other here, but I think it's just yeah. important to acknowledge how important that is in terms of really trying to move things forward. Um, and it's just, um, it's well, just an, an honor to do that. You know, gratitude is a mindset and an attitude I've learned to cultivate mm. in recovery from addiction and mental illness. And the default mode for my brain is to think about the negative, to ruminate about uh, my fears of losing what I have or not getting what I want. Mm -hmm. And part of my mental well-being is to transform that thought process, which is negative to one there, where because I'm trained through cognitive behavioral therapy, which is what 12-step recovery is to me, mm -hmm. to always look every day in a humble way how I can be of service to someone else, um, that gets me out of my own self-centered uh, thinking. And, and so I want to say that this is not out of some like pure ad adulation or sucking up to you. I just want mm. to really point out to your listeners that uh, this is about living life differently. Mm -hmm. And um, it saves us to be 
trying to be uh, open to other people. And uh, so I was grateful to be invited to be on this. Oh, of course. Of course. And that's so well said. And I appreciate even the way that you've already just started to take us on your journey and to show us the importance of that as we walk through those different aspects and have that different approach and that different mindset, all the things that we can do with cognitive behavioral therapy and how important that is for us as we're walking through these journeys. So I re I'm already appreciative of the, you know, I knew you'd be able to bring that level of candor and, and insight and grateful that you've already even started to share that in this moment. Um, and even to follow up on that, as my listeners know, I always like to start out, and you've done this already, just checking in and seeing how people are doing in the midst of everything that we're continuing to experience as a society. Obviously, there are so many things that are going on um, at this point in time, even as we are in the middle of the hearings um, around the January 6th situation, all the things that we're continuing to walk through just as we continue to navigate the pandemic as people are still getting sick, as we're experiencing you know, tragic situation after tragic situation. But then as we also have reasons for hope in the work that we do, as you've alluded to, and just the joy that we can have from being in community with one another. So that was a long-winded introduction, but just to say, I wanted to start there and see just how you're doing at this point in time. I appreciate that. So um, I, I really feel the biology in my brain is what is where I sink or swim because mm. I really feel overwhelmed uh, throughout the week here and there. Mm. But because of that issue of cognitive behavioral therapy, because I know that feelings aren't facts, but in, in recovery, I know that we, I used to drink and drug over mm. feelings, even they're not, even though they're not facts. Like, so I learn in recovery to take a gratitude list of all the great things in my life because I have to do a reality check mm -hmm. because even if with everything, as you said, is so unhinged around us in the world today, and we're really off kilter in my view, in our culture, society, just in large, the toxicity of our political culture, the uh, obviously existential crisis of our environment, uh, these shootings, uh, you know, the feeling of safety, uh, all jeopardized, very big issues that could yeah. really sink anyone. The key here is how do I respond and react? That's how I'm taught in recovery is now what's going on. How do I react to what's going on? And uh, I do it by then talking about, like you said, the hopeful things uh, mm -hmm. by my four year old came into my bed this morning and put his hand on my face like <laughs> that you know his a fact that he's so affectionate mm. i just i lay there and was just soaked that in because it was mm -hmm. like one of the be best parts of the day yesterday i got to give him you know in a in a um, mop up bin where you put all the water to to do the mop i i fit him in he fit into this <laughs> uh, uh bin of water wow. um, and had a bubble bath and it was just, uh, I just great. thought to myself, like, I can see that as a joy today. And that relieves the tension and the stress mm -hmm. of having to kind of ruminate about all that's going on in the world that I, uh, like every other American and anyone else in the world, I could easily get carried away by. Mm -hmm. Well, such a helpful perspective and, and great stories, too. And, you know, as someone who is also a neuroscientist, I'm also you know, I'm resonating with what you're saying about the brain and thinking about all those aspects as well. I um, mean, even topics that we've talked about, even just our interactions with our family members and what that does to our brains and the oxytocin that gets released. And as you said, that just helps us kind of move through and ease them, even as you're so proactive about that mindset shift um, and really using that to move through. So well, I appreciate you know, that. You know, Dr. Addy, I love the neuroscience because, you know, I, I read... Um, the dopamine nation by one of your colleagues out in the in Stanford mm -hmm. talk about how, you know, we're constantly in our society trying to push all the buttons to, to flood our brains with dopamine. And another way of saying is we're engaged in kind of addictive behaviors to try to feed uh, our feeling of anxiety mm -hmm. to medicate that. And you can do it beyond just drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm in recovery from active use of drugs and alcohol, but I can feel those dopamine receptors by quote, acting out in any <laughs> number of the seven deadly sins. Cause they give me a short burst, but in that neuroscience story, it shows me that I have a hangover, whether I'm uh, have drank too much or drug too much or act out too much 
on any number of the um, dopamine stimuli that I could try to use to self-medicate. Anyway, what I'm saying to your audience is that understanding the neuroscience really helps me think about mm. this more than just as a philosophical issue. It explains why I want to be in recovery because that is actually uh, makes me feel better. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and I love yeah. you're mentioning the oxytocin because I hold on to my babies and I, mm. I get all close up. I got five kids because I know that it's yeah. like it's it's not <laughs> medicating for me just to give them hugs. And I know for them it's key mm -hmm. because I know their brains are developing and I want them to be solid foundations. And it's not enough for me just to not drink and drug because I know that makes them feel better but because I want to reinforce kind of positive feelings of, uh, of agency for them and, yeah. and awareness. So. That's great. I love hearing you share about that and just all the things that that does, you know, to our reward centers, as we talk about as well. And then even as you were talking, you know, as I do addiction research and we find that, you know, even if we're doing things in rats or mice, if they play and have that time, it makes it much less likely they'll take more substance or take to excess. So it's wonderful to just hear you, you know, elaborate on that and give these stories as well. And just to, to hear the passion in your voice, because I can really see how that passion has infiltrated into all the work that you've done on so many different fronts, um, especially with the Kennedy Forum and so many other things. Um, so as you've been you know, highlighting those pieces, I wonder if you'd also just share a little bit about how the Kennedy Forum came about. What was the journey that brought you to this place? And then at some point, we'll delve into some of the work that you do within the, within the uh, organization as well. Well, um, you know, I got elected as a state legislator at 21 in Rhode Island as the youngest member. I was elected at 26 to Congress as the youngest member of Congress, and then chosen to be in leadership at 31. I can mm -hmm. guarantee you, Dr. Addy, none of it had to do with my last name being Kennedy whatsoever. It was all my good looks and personality that got me so far. <laughs> of, course, of course, of course. <laughs> so, so there's something very powerful about um, my uncle, President Kennedy's new frontier, the, mm -hmm. the message of, of hopefulness that he gave when he embarked on the uh, Peace Corps, when he set a vision for going to the moon under in under 10 years, which was thought of as being way over his skis at the time. And it's just aspirational aspects mm -hmm. of his um, leadership. And that still resonates to people today who are looking mm -hmm. for narrative mm -hmm. and context. So I've woven his work on civil rights, for example, as the first president to speak about that as a moral issue when he said, who amongst us would trade the color of their skin and then be content with those who counsel patients in delay? In other words, the golden rule. How would you like to be treated? Think about mm -hmm. what it's like to have um, different colored skin and be living in this country where you know, you're still feeling as though the country doesn't accept you. And, you know, the racialization of many institutions in this country that still, you know, is so demoralizing to our friends and neighbors uh, who have different color skin, who don't mm -hmm. feel fully accepted in America. Anyway, my point is, is that these notions are very helpful when I'm advocating for mental health. And mm. ironically, my family was very uh, stigmatizing on mm. mental illness. They were real visionaries and leaders. But, you know, President Kennedy signed the first Community Mental Health Act. But, um, you know, he grew up in a family where no one spoke about his sister's intellectual disability. In mm. fact, mm -hmm after my grandfather chose to have a lobotomy for her and, and that was clearly unsuccessful. And she was kind of put out in a monastery in mm. uh, Wisconsin, never to be seen or heard of again. Wow. Right. That, that shame was so palpable in my mm. father's life, you know, and then thankfully my aunt Eunice, you know, finally got the approval from her brother to speak about it openly when he went after he was elected president and then from that came the Special Olympics, which mm -hmm. is now in over 190 countries around the world and transforming the view towards people with intellectual disabilities. But my point is that the silence and shame that accompanied that, that, that 
terrible situation with my aunt Rosemary, which by the way, was also fueled by a psychiatric illness. Mm -hmm. Many believe that she had a kind of form of bipolar, which coupled with her intellectual disability led her to outbursts that made my grandparents very uncomfortable, which is what led to the lobotomy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about talking about this in a way that isn't stigmatizing. Um, and, you know, when I did mental health and addiction, th- that was very, uh, s- you know, shameful in my family. My mother mm. suffered from profound alcoholism and depression. My father self-medicated. He was traumatized by his brother's assassination, yeah. his murders. I mean, um, but, but you know, it, it was still that way, uh, you know, in, and my father's a very forward thinking guy, but it was hard for him to get past his generation's view of mental health and addiction as a character flaw, mm-hmm. as opposed to a chemistry issue. And I found that in the course of my advocating, I was trying to break this, the shackles of living in that silence and the imprisonment, uh, because I, not only did I suffer from these illnesses, you know, as I said, my whole family did. Mm-hmm. And I, there was something I knew I, I had to do. And by the way, I didn't choose to do this. I, The guy that I was in drug rehab with sold his story of being in drug rehab to the National Enquirer, which mm-hmm. outed me. And mm-hmm. Dr. Addy, that ended up being the best thing that ever happened to me in my life, because instead of like making this a closely guarded secret, when I got to Washington, um, I I had already been outed. So I could put my Mm. name first on a bill that said mental health ought to be treated the same, because unlike my colleagues who are much more senior than me, who could have been the sponsors of that bill. None of them wanted to answer why they were a sponsor of a bill that had both the words mental and addiction mm. in the title. Cause of course, press would naturally ask, well, have you had any of these issues yeah. in your life? No one else wanted to answer them, but because I was a Kennedy, I was exposed early. I hated it at the time, mm. um, but it ended up being one of the best things that ever happened to me. Wow. But that's amazing to hear the the backstory for that too. Because even as you were talking, I was you know because as you talked about the stigma kind of being pervasive, what it was that really helped you push through that to say that there needs to be a shift. And it sounds like there was some, I don't know, serendipity is the right word, but that not that you wouldn't have wanted to, but that there was a situation that allowed you to step into that. And so I really you know applaud you for making that shift. And as you alluded to, it's not that others wouldn't have been navigating that as well. I mean, if we think about our current statistics, one in five who are living currently with a mental illness. So when we think about people in government and politics, that includes all of us. So for you to really be able to take that step and move it forward, I think is so important. Um, Would you say you've seen shifts in the perspective amongst when you are in Congress, amongst your colleagues for moving that forward? Because I can, you know, reading through kind of the process of it and anticipating, I'm sure that there was pushback with that along the way as well. Um, So what, what was that process like? And what have you seen shift over time? So because these are chronic illnesses, just because I went to treatment at 17 didn't mean I was done. Mm -hmm. I constantly grappled with this. And of course, I still tried to keep it secret um, because, of course, I I assumed even as the champion of parity that I was supposed to be better. Right. I was Mm -hmm. supposed to be okay. And of course, our healthcare system never treated my illness the way it does my asthma, which is a chronic Mm -hmm. illness and needs constant attention. It just is a a kind of. acute episodic treatment system, right? That doesn't reimburse for the chronic care nature of these illnesses. So that's a long way of saying when I got a DWI because my illness still hadn't, uh, you know, you know, survived, been succeeded in, in terms of its um, treatment it, because we, these are chronic illnesses. Um, I, I went to, it was very shameful and I went to treatment and it looked as though I was going to have to leave Congress. Mm. I got a lot of letters um, from colleagues telling me you know, that they were pulling for me, which really, you know, folks hmm. that I had never talked to before when I was serving with them. When I got back from um, treatment, I I went and visited many of them to thank them. And mm. it was the first time I'd ever had them tell me about their own challenges. Mm. And then I realized I was in a unique place because I was the only one who had mental illness and addiction tattooed to his forehead mm-hmm. because the, I was the only one of their colleagues that they knew. 
when in fact now I had the opposite uh, benefit. I had the the eyes on the fact that so many of my colleagues yeah. had similar challenges in them, their own lives and in their families' lives that none of the other ones of them knew about. Right. But I had the that secret um, perspective, which I kept secret because they asked me to. Mm-hmm. But but I I met a lot of my colleagues and. Uh, 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 some of them uh, who who told me very harrowing stories about their own family's mental illness and addiction voted against our Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. Hmm. And I never outed them or challenged them on it. I did talk to them later okay. on. I said, how could you have voted a no on that bill? I thought you told me about, you know, uh, suicide in your family, your daughter's eating disorder and so forth. And they said, well, well, Patrick, I don't come from the same part of the country you come from. Hmm. I come from the buckle of the Bible belt. Um, your constituents may be all right reelecting you, but I can't be sure mine would reelect me hmm. if they knew. And and then wow. they said something even more powerful. They said, frankly, when I think about it, if my child ever felt um, that they were exposed, I can't be sure what they would do which of course the end of that sentence is I can't be sure whether they wouldn't take their lives mm-hmm. because of the shame of these illnesses. So, mm-hmm. I mean, that still shows you that um, we made progress, but there's still a lot of caveats to that progress. Mm-hmm. I also tell people like we passed this law, but it wasn't because everybody woke up one day and said, Oh, wouldn't it be a good thing that we cover the brain like we would every other organ of the body. We passed this law because um, Chris Dodd was a friend of my family's mm. and and our bill in the House was the better of the two bills. And I got Chris to pass our bill, H.R. 1424, by writing the whole Economic Stabilization Act of 2008, which mm. is the Toxic Asset Relief Program. In other words, mm. the seven to eight hundred billion dollar bailout of Jamie Dimon and all the big bankers that got us into this mess in the first place with our meltdown and banking crisis in 2008. Mm. That's how we got the parity bill wow. passed. So when George Bush signed um, the parity law, he was really signing it because it contained the provisions to get our country out of getting into another financial Great Depression. He wasn't signing it mm. because it mandated coverage for depression. So, um, you know, the bottom line is we up until COVID, I haven't seen any traction on mental mm. health. And mm. since the time I left Congress till today, I've been pushing for the enforcement of the mental health parity law really to no avail. All mm. of the leading psychiatric hospitals and um, addiction treatment providers really did not put their shoulder behind this, even though this was good for them. And mm-hmm. the reason was, is because they didn't want to offend the big payers mm-hmm. because all of them were so dependent on the Uniteds and Etnas and Anthems and Cygnus. Uh, and so it was interesting to me, the very people who should have been the most supportive right. We're kind of the most reticent. And I thought to myself, if we can't get the very very providers who benefit from this law to support its implementation, how am I going to get everyone else to support it who, you know, feel stigmatized because these illnesses? So we're finally getting some attention. But Mm -hmm. Dr. Addy, it's because corporate America is nervous that they're, you know, the great resignation and the competition for talent mm. means that they better do something on mental health because mm-hmm. these Gen Xers uh, and and others, these young uh, workforce is demanding no less. And they know intuitively that if they don't invest in mental health, not only is it a cost on their total work health care costs in their workforce, but it's a cost to their economic productivity. Yeah. And but but still today. Uh, Dr. Addy, we have not wrapped our arms around the full economic implications Mm -hmm. of poor mental health and the full benefits of real good integrated mental health into the rest of physical health care. And until we do, it's Mm going to be still a push and pull to get corporations to do what's in their self-interest, to get insurance companies to get past this gatekeeper idea that all they need to be doing in this world is limiting 
uh, you know, cost and a- access, which is counterproductive in mm-hmm. every way, as we know from early data. So it's still a long ways to go. Yeah, the long haul. And I appreciate that way. I mean, you, that's a very, the way you've given us just the full context. I mean, even from the early work and the, st- the strategy involved in that and how you had to, you know, partner with others to really move things along in a certain way. But it sounds like you're also being very savvy about the motivation behind that as well. Um, and yeah, you were kind of touching on this. Do you feel like there, you know, with everything that's happened with COVID, is there any shift whatsoever, or any greater acknowledgement that you think will help move things forward? Or is it still just all these aspects of resistance that you've talked about that are still kind of the major roadblocks? So the 800 pound gorilla is that we don't have enough workers to meet the current crisis. Mm-hmm. We're not going to have near the workers we need to meet the future mental health crisis. We've got a tsunami, the racial pandemic, the COVID mm-hmm. pandemic, the economic dislocation, moving into more techni- uh, technical, technology-based economies, the dislocation of workers, the global implications, uh, Ukraine, uh, the virus, uh, you know, the environment. Uh, I mean, it's just no shortage. And we're really not using, as I said earlier, our prefrontal cortex. <laughs> we're we're really yeah. acting out of our, you know, mammalian brain. You know, our amygdala is in full flight, and I really think we need neuroliteracy in, mm. in this country. In other words, I think you know, a generation ago, corporate America pushed STEM education. You know, they didn't think we had enough scientists, technologists, mathematicians. China was eating our lunch. You know, the rest of the world was advancing. So corporate America said, oh, we got to teach this in our schools. And that's Mm -hmm. what we ended up shifting our educational paradigm. We're going to need to do the same on neuroliteracy. And Mm -hmm. the reason I'm saying it is if we don't have the next generation of workers able to manage, cope with stress, we're not going to have a productive workforce. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think this existential crisis in corporate America with the great resignation, and I think it's got them thinking, oh, my God, like, what are we going to do? Like, this is mm-hmm. a whole new generation. They're not subscribing to the old traditional paradigm of work. And what is it going to mean to have them work for us? How are we going to make sure they're optimal in their capacity and we retain them? I just think that it's going to now require that they really go back and think, how are we producing people in this world in a way where they can be much more productive? And and it's basically about a prevention model, because Mm -hmm. if we don't have that, then stress, as you know, is the is the environmental factor that can tip off the genetic predisposition Mm -hmm. to all array of mental illnesses and addictions, particularly. So the key is to interrupt that that stress where possible through tools that people can use so that their predisposition, if they have a greater vulnerability to depression and anxiety or needing Mm -hmm. disorder or alcoholism, that they, they can acknowledge that and then intervene and do these things that we're just talking about, you know, go outside, connect with family, understand the value of um, interpersonal relationships Mm -hmm. um, to their own mental health. So uh, yeah, I think there's a lot to wrap our arms around here. Yeah. Well, so many important pieces of what you've pulled out too as well. I mean, as you acknowledge, just the workforce shortage, but then also just the need for the workforce to be infiltrated in a sense. And obviously that can be a challenge when there aren't enough, but I'm thinking, you know, in terms of clinicians and, and researchers and just being out in the community and helping with this, with this literacy as it were, so to speak. Um, and all the just different things that you've highlighted of all the needs that are there that where things really need to kind of push and move forward. Um, so going back to something we mentioned at the, you know, the top of the episode too, even just thinking about hope in the midst of everything, because you've obviously had some things that have been put into place that aren't necessarily being implicated as much as they should. But at the same time, you're continuing to move things forward, even in the midst of that. So I'm thinking about all the different initiatives that you've been involved in. I'm thinking about One Mind. I'm thinking about the Candy Satcher Center for Mental Health Equity at the Morehouse School of Medicine, which seemed like it was pioneering in many ways, speaking about and moving forward in those aspects. I'm thinking about the work that you've been um, involved in and the, the, all that's going on with the WIT and the United Behavioral Health uh, case as well. 
So I'm wondering, even in the midst of the challenges, how do you see hope in the midst of what you're trying to do in some of these efforts? Because I've also heard you say things like, and you've alluded to that here, that we need to get to a new normal. So how do you how do you balance those two? I guess this is also it's a little bit of a personal question, but also a little bit of a uh, programmatic question in terms of how you just go about this work on a day to day basis with all that needs to be done. Well, I. I get on my knees in the morning. I try to humble myself mm. and think about what my greatest purpose and utility mm. is. And I know, as I mentioned earlier, <laughs> you know, I may not have had the smartest, you know, best grade point average or the best this. I've been blessed with this family narrative that mm. I think is very conducive to pulling these different strings together mm. and creating a, a narrative. I think we've missed the narrative mm. in this because we have addiction over here and mental illness over here. And then people with mental wellness issues aren't seeing themselves in either bucket. We just don't have this holistic picture that this is good for everybody. It's mm -hmm. you know, yeah. green berets have more mental health than any other branch of the service. And how do I know that? because John F. Kennedy awarded the wearing of the Green Beret. And I went and rededicated the Fort Bragg Special Warfare School named for John F. Kennedy. And it was at that that Ge General Hugh Shelton, first chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, came up to me and said, uh, Congressman, we have more mental health for our Green Berets than any other branch of the service. And I knew mm -hmm. he had seen my CV. So I thought to myself, well, he's just being political. So mm -hmm. I said, General, listen, these Green Berets, they don't need mental health. They jump out of airplanes and they... They hit the water and they 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 swim underwater for five miles without breathing. And, and then they hit the beach and they speak six languages and they take out their target and they're reading to their kids by dinner time. I mean, <laughs> they don't need mental health. And General Shelton said, Congressman, you don't understand. And I was like, mm. take him back. Like, uh, what? And he said, we look at mental health as a force multiplier. Mm. And I thought to myself, brilliant. I had never heard that before. I just thought of mental health as being about deficits. I never thought about mental mm. health being the glass was half full. Like, you mean people who are strong also need mental health? And so I asked him about it. He said, yeah, we need our special operators to, to work at their optimal, mm. full capacity. Um, and, and so I was like, that makes sense. And, and my point is, is that that and then my family history of civil rights got me this perspective, like when David Satcher, who I'd worked with uh, when he was Surgeon General, mm -hmm. was the first Surgeon General to do a mental health report, called on me after I left Congress, said, do you want to be part of Morehouse School of Medicine? I mean, first I had to say yes, because David Satcher was in jail with Dr. King amongst mm -hmm. a lot of young student protesters at the time. And to my view of growing up, they're part of our founding fathers. They're the mm -hmm. ones who lay mm -hmm. the groundwork for a modern day America where we passed the Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, Fair Housing Act, Fair Employment, all of which laid the ground, ground for progress in this country, for more Americans to be included in the circle of opportunity. And as opposed to us just being an elite selective society of just a few people who had all the power. So I said, yes, that was, you know, 10 years before George Floyd. Mm -hmm. I had no idea because as most white Americans, like this thing that we now saw with George Floyd was happening every single day mm -hmm. in America. We just weren't, we didn't have it captured on video like it was so painfully captured when, when George Floyd was killed. And since then, there's been 229 additional Black people who've been killed at the hands of police since George Floyd. I, I only know that, I, 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 tragically to say, because I've been pulled into mm -hmm. Morehouse because mm -hmm. of Dr. Satcher, his relationship with my family, my relationship with him to be have a little bit broader perspective than I would mm -hmm. have otherwise. And so I've been the one who's learned about what is vicarious trauma. And when others tell me it, well, it's like seeing your family members kill mm -hmm. routinely on t television and these photos because of the color of their skin, 
you know, and I can't, I have to go into my closet. One of my friends said, and, and take out all the hoodies in my closet because I'm worried my son is going to be killed. Mm-hmm. I'm saying to myself, that's not my experience. And, and then it dawns on me, I have a moral obligation to do everything I can, mm. because if that were me, I can't imagine the rage that I would have mm. if my family members were constantly stopped because they were suspected of, of committing some type of crime, because that's how we've racialized our mm-hmm. criminal justice system. In, in any event, all of this, Dr. Addy, is not out of my personal choice. I have Mm. been born in an environment that has worked on me and shaped me, Mm -hmm. which I owe my, you know, existence to. So when I think about what do we need to do, I think about trying to tie this together um, as a modern day medical version Mm. of, of civil rights. Because if you think about it, mental health is separate and unequal. Mm. And you think about people who suffer from mental illness, marginalized. Mm -hmm. And by the way, like black people shot inordinately Mm -hmm. during emergency response vis-a-vis the general population. Mm -hmm. And like with communities of color, also incarcerated at much bigger numbers, right? Than the, so so you've got a lot of the same dynamics. I never would have made those Mm -hmm. connections had I not had my life experiences. So when I say I get down on my knees, I think about, well, what's my job? Mm. It's to move with the, what I've been given. And I've been given these ways of looking at the world, um, which help me, in my view, advance this advocacy. And by mm-hmm. the way, I can advance it because I got this family name. I've got connections to the corridors of power. Um, I can bring attention and I don't have to feel diminished because Mm. I also have depression Mm -hmm. and anxiety. I also have drug addiction. You know, I don't have to. Whereas if I didn't have my last name, maybe I wouldn't be so racing to the door Mm. to be an advocate because let's be honest, if people were just to look at me as someone who's in recovery from a mental illness or addiction, I could easily be dismissed. So I feel like I have, and by the way, I spent a a better part of my day helping my friends get connected to care just in Mm. the micro world. Mm. And also calling up my friends from insurance companies Mm. saying, you got to cover this person. It's your legal obligation. And they do it, but that's only because that's what what God has given me to Mm. do with what I have been given in my life. So um, finding purpose to me is the way to find hope. Yeah. That's so powerful. I mean, so, so much of what you said resonates on so many levels. I mean, obviously it's sobering at the same time, it's also refreshing and just hearing you talk through that, just seeing all the ways that you've really just walked in community with others. So it sounds like you're not coming in saying that you, you have all this understanding already, but you're partnering with, with people who are trusted who are colleagues, who are friends, even as you talked about Dr. Stratcher and learning from people's experiences and just the way that you have been able to incorporate that and, and get that level of understanding. Grant that you didn't walk through it yourself, but just even as you related to the rage that you would feel if you were in that similar situation. And I would say that's so important that even, you know, even as you're sharing, I'm still kind of just processing and taking in all of the, again, the passion that's there and the ways that you've really been adamant about putting it into practice and making sure that it's something that can really help us shift and move how we go about these things on a, on a day-to-day basis. So just again, gratitude for, for the ways that you've acknowledged the, the, the role that you have, the opportunity that you have in walking alongside others to really make sure that that comes um, to fruition in so many different ways. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, of course, um, my, I've voted against defense of marriage act. I was signing on everything civil rights, uh, LGBTQ, hmm. you know, it's politically the right thing to do, right? That's from my mindset. You know, yeah. I have a, I have a family member, a daughter now who's grappling with identity. Hmm. I could never have imagined why the work that I did, you know, decade or two ago hmm. around this issue could come home. Hmm. Right. So 
we, and, and I try to tell people, even if you haven't had a mental illness or addiction in your family, it's going to come home to you at some mm. point. And what kind of world do you want for your yeah. love? Do yeah. you want to have to wait six months before you can see Dr. Addy? Because that's right now what it takes to get a really good psychiatric, uh, you know, uh, 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 hearing. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then uh, what kind of uh, therapeutic, are you going to just be set shipped off to some kind of one size fits all approach or mm -hmm. is your loved one going to kind of get the curated best evidence-based treatment for their particular diagnosis? Mm -hmm. So I was fortunate to get great psychi psychiatric care myself, but I didn't get cognitive behavioral therapy, Dr. Addy. I was, uh, and I'm very much interested in getting CBT mm -hmm. um, more adopted just generally and, and, and incentivizing that and having kind of an Angie's list and a match.com set mm -hmm. up so that if I need to get care and if my daughter you know, has to get some skills with mm -hmm. eating disorders that she's not going to someone who's just good on depression, anxiety, mm -hmm. even though she has depression, anxiety, like what is it that she'll need? I yeah. want therapists that are going to be good for her. Mm -hmm. Right. And right now she'll be lucky. She gets anybody. Right. Yeah. Not the least of which is someone who can actually help her with her particular challenges mm -hmm. or someone who can help me with mine. So we need to really ramp up the delivery of evidence-based treatment in addition to doing the, what the parity law says, and that is pay for it. Mm -hmm. so, uh, obviously chicken and egg, like you yeah. got to put a lot more money in this. <laughs> yeah. But, but my hope is that when we put more money in it, we also demand kind of greater outcomes at the same time, because we have a double problem. We have a tr problem of accessing mental health, but then mm -hmm. we have another problem of accessing quality mental health. Mm -hmm. And we need to do both. And that, by the way, takes, you know, payers, but it, and then of course it takes providers. Yeah. So it's not an either or we need both yeah. of them to be together in this. Yeah. It's so challenging, as you mentioned, you know, with some of the guests that we've had on this program too, even though we talk about, you know, some of the severe mental illnesses and um, things around suicide prevention, as you are familiar with from your work, just ways that we actually, in some ways need to rebuild the system, but what can we do in the meantime to really help things move forward? Um, and so, again, just know that the work that you're doing is so important in so many different ways. Um, and I wonder if you also just talk a little bit about, you know, the ongoing case and what really needs to shift and ways that you think that we can do that to have an impact, even with the ongoing um, case I alluded to earlier. Yeah, well, we need advocacy. That's mm. the big missing piece. Like, it's, mm. it's not as if I don't have the whole matrix of policies Mm -hmm. already enumerated mm -hmm. by every subcommittee in the United States Congress, like we've never had before. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is not just the purview of the health committee. It's the purview of the housing committee, the labor committee, the education committee. And my point is, is that it's a comprehensive approach, but mm -hmm. What we need are we need people to sign up and some people will be interested in the supportive housing and the community model. Others will be about the neuroscience and coming up with new pharmaceutical interventions. Others will be about expanding and getting rid of the IMD exclusion so people can get adequate inpatient access to care, um, uh, you know, expanding the telemental health. Mm -hmm. The point is, is that we just need an advocacy movement and we need to look at what the Chamber of Commerce has done, the League of Conservation Voters, the AFL-CIO. You, you can name your advocacy group. Mm. They've got it all. They've got the what is the uniform kind of agenda that unites all of the affiliates within organized labor. Well, there's different types of unions, but they all kind of agree, well, we need kind of uh, minimum wage, fair labor, pensions, we need decent health care, you know, mm -hmm. you've got some standards, right? Um, and and in environment, it's, you know, it's League of Conservation Voters. Yeah, some of us are interested in air, as asthmatic, water, mm -hmm. land, you know, it's the, the whole idea is, yeah, but we have a uni unified agenda. These are the big issues. Yeah. Like, we don't have that in mental health yet. We mm. Parity for years was kind of the singular issue that united the whole community, whether you had addiction or mental illness, whether you were a psychiatrist or psychologist. We need to bake this so that everybody yeah. sees their own advantage and we get 
as I said, the 20 eight million Americans in long-term recovery who are mm-hmm. quote anonymous out of these church basements and understanding that our founder, Bill W testified in front of Congress um, that nothing you can say you're a person of long-term recovery without having to mm-hmm. acknowledge the exact 12 step group that you belong to mm-hmm. and still maintain the 11th tradition of privacy at the level of press um, newspaper and radio. So we just don't have a sophistication in advocacy that lends itself to ramping these issues up because mm. my wife ran for Congress this last cycle. I could not get a list of families impacted by this illness. Mm. Uh, I couldn't get a list of all the paraprofessionals who treat these illnesses. I couldn't get, I mean, I could just keep going on and on. Whereas Mm -hmm. if I wanted to, you know, reach uh, working families, I had every single union mailing list. I I would make a phone call. There would be an automatic rally. You know, my wife went out, wife went out to do canvassing. She'd be accompanied with 50 other of Mm -hmm. her fellow teachers. Like we need that in mental health and addiction. And if we don't get that, Dr. Adley, we can have all these great policies, yeah. but they're not going to translate because we don't put the money behind them and we don't put the bodies behind mm-hmm. them. And that's what we need the most. Yeah. Just to change all the way around from, like you said, to make it sure that it's, I mean, I'm thinking back to what you said about the Green Berets too. It seemed like it was baked into every aspect of what they did. And that was really where it started and where it ended and how it just wrapped around. So as much as we need to do that on all these different Components, as you mentioned, on all these different subcommittees, on all these different topics, so important in so many ways. Um, I'm, I'm glad you brought your wife up as well. You know, um, also thinking about you know her role previously as an educator and how important that component is too. Even as you were talking about some of the CBT, you know, I have uh, some clinical psychology colleagues who've talked about how they love to see some of those principles integrated into the schools from day one, so that people would have these skills being taught within that system and have these skills to approach things. Because even as you mentioned, these are not, oh, you only need these if you're starting to navigate a mental illness. But these are life skills, mental wellness that we should be incorporating. Um, So I'm wondering, you know, in the work that you all have done, even the work that your wife has done, how is that perspective in terms of thinking about education and some of the challenges around mental health and what needs to happen there? How has that perspective also impacted the work that you've been doing? Well, if you think about it, you know, you got all these point source solutions for obesity or sleep or what have you. We we basically need a life a, a learning management system for life mm. where <laughs> we kind of like the internet model. We understand how the whole thing works. We know how to do, you know, Google and we know how to do we need to have now some of us may have how do we overcome these um, delusions? And, you know, frankly, people with uh, psychotic disorders, there is, you know, kind of behavioral therapy on how to, and there's even with suicide ideation, it's not mm-hmm. just simply a matter of depression. Mm-hmm. And I know John Crystal and others at Yale have been really formative in this. Uh, mm-hmm. It's about a particular type of impulse control that you can actually do kind of behavioral therapy around and actually reduce the suicide rate in this country. And yet mm-hmm. we don't use that, especially when we have people come get admitted in the ERs for suicide ideation. We don't immediately say, hey, by the way, there's this program where you can dramatically reduce the likelihood of you mm-hmm. ever dying by your own hand because now you will have the tools necessary when you feel that desperation uh, to not act on it. And uh, if you could get the the results in cancer that you can get in mental health by Mm -hmm. adopting these evidence based, I mean, it'd be a no brainer. Plus we'd be paying for it. Dr. Mm -hmm. We have greater therapeutic interventions that could make a bigger uh, survival uh, difference than all of these other medical uh, per, you know, uh, services that get reimbursed to, to oodles of dollars mm-hmm. to pay for those. Mm-hmm. So, and only move the disease burden on the margins, right? Compared to what would happen in this mm-hmm. space. So I would say that 
I, I really believe we need to understand kind of at a basic level, what's the handbook in life? How do we mm. understand our brain, how it works? How do we maximize our own challenges? And, and by the way, that could apply to personal relationships for mm-hmm. some. It could apply to drugs and alcohol for others. It could apply, um, you know, to workplace issues or it, it, you know, it's it's the mechanisms that are the same, no matter what your choice of what's your bedevilments, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why the twelve step program generally is worked across gambling and narcotics and alcoholism and and obesity and all because the principles are what are universal. We need to embed that kind of principles in a in a learning management system that allows you to to customize if Mm -hmm. you will Mm -hmm. those principles for you in your own life so you learn how to break that default thinking as it applies to you like Mm -hmm. everyone's always after me or they're all trying to get me or i'm full of resentments or well let's think about how to dismantle that because it's put taking me offline from being able to achieve what i want to achieve if people, Americans love looking better, feeling better, you know, why not make this the thing that we want? Yeah. Because if it's if it's happiness, we're all for, right? It's fulfillment, contentment. The best way to sell that is to make that sort of uniquely American consumerism apply to how do I become a better consumer for my own mental health? Mm-hmm. Um So that's how I would think about it. And of course, you know, of course, in education, you've got that universal uh, public health approach. So you're Mm -hmm. not trying to play catch up Mm -hmm. down the line when I'm in my 20s trying to get recovered from addiction. Mm -hmm. If I had earlier on, you know, been equipped to have to be more aware, um, I wouldn't let myself constantly be kind of diluted into thinking that I still have got this, like Mm -hmm. I can still manage my life, um, which is what is the great um, unifying factor of all people with addiction, mental illness is that they think they're not as bad as they really are. It's Mm -hmm. that denial that we talk about, Mm -hmm. but but education's where we could lay the foundation for a really strong future on mental health. Yeah. I wholeheartedly agree. And as much as we can set those foundations and put those things in place and more that people like you and hopefully people like me and others are partnering to really make sure that that really becomes embedded in, in our in our education, in our framework, and our mentality. Um, and I'm grateful, you know, that some have started to speak up about it. But again, there's so much more that we have to do um, around that front as well. But it's so, so important, as you've enumerated. And again, just thinking about even what you're doing with some of the initiatives, even like One Mind, and making sure that there's opportunities for the research to be done, but for also for people to be able to go out and to talk about that research and make sure that it's embedded um, yeah, in no, everything that we the, do. I love the basic science of One Mind, which is basically if you take um, neurodegenerative disorders, which are such a big challenge, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, Mm -hmm. uh, and the like, and you look at all the affective disorders, depression, anxiety, Mm -hmm. addiction, like, you know, you would think that, well, if you study the signature wounds of war, traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress, which you could get the defense establishment, and by the way, you know, define as a national security issue, which Mm -hmm. would then the, generate the kind of federal investment that you wouldn't mm. be able to get if you just defined it as a kind of a medical issue. Mm. Right? Mm. Like you could get the world to get behind this, these global data sets that allow us to track various interventions because mm-hmm. the brain is the most complex organ of the body. In order to decode it, you need data on the size that you've never seen before. Yeah. And it, ironically, you know, to back to this narrative piece, JFK did the race to space. That's when we needed supercomputers. That's when mm-hmm. they started. Mm-hmm. Today, it's the race to inner space mm-hmm. that is the big new frontier, right? It's 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 discovering the galaxy of neurons in our brain and understanding therapeutic interventions that can save someone with ALS to someone with debilitating OCD. And, and by the way, if you're studying Parkinson's, you have to understand the dopamine response. So you have to understand depression. Who would imagine a neurodegenerative 
uh, you know, illness could also be a big Mm -hmm. point of interest for people with affective disorders. Mm -hmm. In other words, we're all in this together. Yeah. And I just think that um, the, 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 space station concept where the world sees its kind of combined interest yeah. would be a great kind of, because for us to be saved in America, we need to get the Chinese online with data on as far as brain. And we need Australians and the Europeans, <laughs> Latin Americans. I mean, we really yeah. need to Worldwide. be global in our yeah. approach. And we have the super computing capacity like never before. So we could really start to understand this and get real solutions Mm -hmm. but we need a narrative and that's what we've been missing yeah fully agree the narrative and the community working together right uh, which is so important again something that i've definitely seen in your work um, on so many different levels as well um, and I'll say this is a you know this podcast itself is also about community. One thing that we're trying to do also is just trying to actually incorporate input and feedback from the listeners as well. So I wanted to pivot slightly and just also talk about the new hotline, um, the nine eight eight or forthcoming hotline um, that's being made available. One of our listeners had a question about that, and just if you'd be willing to just kind of talk about um, your perspectives on that and what what you see um, as the uh, improvements or or what that all will mean for us um, as a country as you try. To move forward on so many of these important topics. Well, as you know, our uh, criminal justice system has been the default for a lack of a mental health system mm-hmm. and addiction treatment system. So we end up incarcerating people because we don't give them the interventions mm-hmm. for their mental illness or addiction. And as you know, we incarcerate a greater percentage of our population than any other free industrialized nation in the world. So the indictment is actually on our justice system, Mm -hmm. that it's not working. Um, It's not keeping us safe. You know, there is 75 percent recidivism from state prison within five years, 50 percent within two years. Mm. Um, A majority of uh, violent crimes are committed by people who already been in prison. Like we Mm -hmm. we should just look at this thing and think, of well, where do we want incarceration? We want incarceration to protect us. But outside of that, what do we want? We want to be making sure that we treat people with mental illness We treat people with addiction and we, in the 988, we're in the first opportunity to really seek fundamental reform in this paradigm, because instead of the police officers showing up, which, as I mentioned earlier, if you have a mental illness or you're a person of color, you're more Mm -hmm. likely to be shot um, and have a much obviously poor response. Um, Let's think about how this 988, you you could have in in communities of color, someone show up that looks like the community they're coming from. You could have someone show up who's not only uh, someone looks like the community, but knows the situations mm-hmm. in terms of if it's a person with mental illness, knows how to de-escalate um, and provide the right intervention so that one, they don't get a criminal record. And therefore, they're able to recover because it, it's easier to recover if you can still get a job because yeah. you don't have this uh, conviction sitting over your head. Wouldn't it be get to, great to get pre-adjudication in all of that? And by the way, some of these service courts like mental health courts, um, uh, drug courts and the like are, are already showing the value of this. Mm. <clears throat> In Rhode Island, I was really proud to be part of expanding the veterans courts. Mm, so yeah. in the wake of Iraq and Afghanistan, we had mo- second highest percentage of our um, Guard and Reserve war police units, military mm. police. And they all came from Rhode Island's municipal police um, academies and organizations. And what happened was when they came back from Iraq and Afghanistan, they found themselves showing up at incidences where they were arresting the very fellow officers they had just served in Afghanistan with and in Iraq with who were suffering from the untreated impact Mm. of post-traumatic stress. And, And so, of course, it was bothering them. This was happening. Yeah. And why should we be locking up one of our freedom fighters, one of our veterans, because we didn't adequately take care of their, quote, invisible wounds of war. But frankly, as you know, 
our response to the quote invisible wounds of war has been invisible in many respects. Yeah. We've tried to ramp up in the years past, but we've been playing catch up mm -hmm. with 22 veterans dying each day to, at their own hands. So mm -hmm. my point is, is that we need a different emergency response. And um, if we have a different response, we get different outcomes mm -hmm. down the line. So why not try to train that up? Now, to do this, you have to build out a whole uh, continuum of care, which, as I mentioned earlier, we've so underfunded mental health all these years, we don't have an infrastructure yeah. to meet this need. 988, in my view, Dr. Addy is going to show the pitfalls of our current system mm. as being inadequate because when we stand this up, everyone expects the number of crisis calls to minimally, minimally quadruple, just grow wow. exponentially. Wow. And we don't even have the capacity to yeah. meet our current needs, yeah. let alone inviting people to use a three digit number as opposed to 911 to call for a mental health crisis response. And I just think the thing's going to fall down and implode on itself. And then hopefully um, that will spur us into mm. action and we'll say, oh my God, we were, we're a little premature on this, or maybe we didn't get ourselves organized for it enough. And we'll do what we need to do mm. to, to follow that up. So um, 988 is a big deal. Uh, honestly, there's very little understanding of it amongst mm. the local, mm. uh, county, municipal level um, officials that are going to be necessary to put this in, into effect. And so if they don't understand it, yeah. then, and if, by the way, there's no kind of really good technical assistance and how to, then what kind of system, because by the way, it's going to change from locale to locale because yeah. some yeah. Systems are going to have really good kind of maybe urgent care or really good, uh, the right number of um, people to answer the phone. But what about the people to show up mm -hmm. to help that person? Are there enough of those people? And and what about the places to go? So if you got a person answering the call, then you need someone to show up. Then yeah. you need a place to go. Like we, we need like the whole continuum yeah. and different places in the country have different aspects of that continuum. And, uh, and we'll, it's going to be a while before we do do this right. But I'm glad at least that we're mm -hmm. moving down this road. And yeah. in my view, this is the single biggest policy paradigm shift in mental health that we've mm. seen since the parity law mm. um, in terms of its implications on the whole system. Yeah. That, that's saying a lot. That's saying a lot. But as you mentioned, I think it's it's the healthy perspective, too, just to see where things are moving, but knowing that it will also likely open up things that also still need to be done. Um, and so I, you know, I appreciate you full, sharing that full perspective. And you know, as you've been talking, as we've been going through this episode, I think this is also one of those episodes where hopefully it will facilitate and encourage people to actually look into things and actually do some homework around some of these topics, too. I mean, so much of what you share is really about just education across the board and how we think about these topics and the work that you've you've been doing as well. So I hope that people will feel inspired um, by the journey that you've been on and what you've been doing so far, but also inspired to dig in themselves um, and to also look for ways to educate themselves, educate their community members, and to tap into some of these programs as well. Um, but as we wrap up, uh, any closing thoughts that you want to leave our listeners with? I mean, there's so, so many highlights and so many important things that you've pulled out in the conversation, but... No, Anything I, that you really I, want to leave folks with? I, I, I'd say, you know, with COVID, we got real-time data on everyone today that got mm. COVID, their comorbidities, mm. and we've got a public health response. Our data on suicide, our data on overdose is two years old, and mm. it's it's uh, messy data, meaning it doesn't give us the, the information we need to make good policy decisions. We need to systematically really understand what data we need to, to track to get the right uh, public health response, and also to align the financial incentives in our private sector system to pay for the value that comes from, for example, paying for supportive housing vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis inpatient psychiatric care, right? Maybe we, we really need to understand the social determinants of health as it impacts mental health, along yeah. with the impact of good therapy and good medicine and all of these other things and good providers. So I would just encourage people to, you know, lean in on this. This to me is the big 
you know, we've got a lot of big issues to solve, but if we don't solve the mental health piece, we're not going to get around the toxicity of our political culture. We're not going to be able to think straight about how to solve some of these environmental challenges because of the, you know, us ignoring the global um, warming. We're not going to be able to deal with all of these issues of, of, of racial pandemic and public health pandemic of COVID if we don't really get to be stronger in our understanding ourselves and how we relate and how we communicate and how our brains work. So a lot to do, but I'm thrilled to be on your uh, podcast and that you've got listeners that are interested in this and uh, please, uh, well, I know we'll put in the um, links, you know, some of the work that we're doing in case anyone's interested in uh, being part of it. Of course. Well, Congressman Kennedy, thank you so much for your time, for all the things that you shared. I know me personally, I'm going to go back and re-listen to this because there's so many important gems that you dropped throughout this episode. And just, you know, I I just, again, appreciate the way you put things in full context, both in terms of things that have been put in place, but then also the work that needs to be done and where things have stalled. So I think, you know, I think also speaking from a mental health advocacy standpoint, I think it's always important to, to hold both of those um, together as we try to move forward. And then I'm wrapping it up again, just thinking about the hope and just the importance of community, um, even as you talked about your time with your family and your kids. And I feel like hopefully for you, even in this conversation, it's been very generative in that sense. No? So I think this is also a representation of that, even on so many levels, as we try to partner together in these efforts across our society. So thank you again for taking thank the time you. and for being here. Thanks, Nay, And I look forward to meeting you in person. Yeah, that would be wonderful. 